This is Dead Serious, a show about short horror stories worthy of discussion. I'm Dead Pallet, and I'm reading an SCP entry, Invisibilla Buddies. Today's entry is SCP-1215. As always, the link can be found to this entry down in the description. I said that grammatically incorrect, but suck a dick. Item number, SCP-1215. Object class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-1215 must be contained within a locked room pursuant Standard Level 2, Moderate Threat, Type 3, Visual Stimuli, Mind-Altering Protocols. Access Required Written Approval. Or Access Requires Written Approval. So just by seeing whatever this thing is, your mind will be altered in some form or fashion. Due to the subject's age and fragile nature, SCP-1215 must be maintained in a hermetically sealed chamber of inert gas with extremely low humidity at temperatures of 10 degrees Celsius. SCP-12 should not be exposed to ultraviolet light for longer than absolutely necessary. Routine inspection and maintenance as necessary is to be performed twice monthly by religious D-class personnel certified in care of rare books and manuscripts. Cooperation of D-class personnel is grounds for indefinite suspension of their termination. Failure to comply with these measures will result in the object's significant damage and or destruction. So I already know what this is because of the picture right next to it, but I like the concept, um, just in its, in its purest form of something that is extremely dangerous is also extremely fragile and needs extra protection in some form or fashion. Personnel exposed to SCP-1215 are to be placed in isolation for their own protection and the protection of other personnel. So being exposed to SCP-1215 15 not only puts you in danger but those around you. A sincere confession and repentance of one's sins to qualify uh, to a qualified priest of the affected personnel's religion, even for religious traditions which do not include a traditional rite, confessional rite, has been shown to cause the effects of SCP-1215 to subside over the twalo- following 24 to 48 hours. For non-religious personnel, confessions to individuals holding doctorates in philosophy have been proven effective in approximately 60% of uh, cases. Personnel who cry while confessing generally recover more quickly and, if not religious, have higher likelihoods of recovery. Non-D-class personnel who are asymptomatic after 14 days may resume their previous duties after the successful completion of a psychiatric examination. So everything there seems very concrete and clear, um, concise, and it all ducktails nicely together. All of it is sensible, and it explores eventualities that you might wonder. Because it's talking about religion, so what happens if a person isn't religious? It answers those questions. Those experiments have been conducted, and those results have been acquired. Description. SCP-1215 is a 14th century illuminated manuscript written in medieval Greek on vellum. It was recovered by an archaeology, archaeological dig of a Byzantine monastery in redacted Turkey. Illustrations are decorative with both gold and silver. The manuscript is a version of the Perilogismon, apparently an original copy written by the work's author, Eva Grisi, Eva Grisius, Eva Grisius, the solitary Ponticius, Ponticus, oh my god, Brandon, who lived from uh, 13, 345 to 399 CE, a Christian monk and ascetic. The Perilogimon is a treatise on temptation and the eight evil thoughts, thoughts, because, um, that, <laughs> proceeded to the more modern seven deadly sins. The text of the the text of SCP-1215 varies appreciably from other copies of the work. 
So apparently, whatever this thing does, it seems as though it is playing with temptation because it's written by um, an ascetic monk. You know, you're supposed to avoid temptation and all of those kinds of things. I like that, even though we're dealing with subject matter that I normally find is tasteful. Uh, the Seven Deadly Sins, I think it's just been, it's been done to death, people talking about The Seven Deadly Sins. Here, we're looking at the history of it, and I think maybe because of that we're going to get a deeper understanding of why this is what it is and its place in uh, Christian orthodoxy. Individuals to, you know what, real quick, I should explain what a, a uh, illuminated manuscript is for those that don't know and didn't get a useless degree like I did. An illuminated manuscript is a manuscript in which the text is supplemented with such decorations as initials, borders, and miniature illustrations. So basically, it's like an icon creepypasta. Individuals exposed to the text or illustrations with S within SCP-1215 have their behaviors altered, though these alterations do not appear to manifest themselves until the individual leaves the immediate proximity of the object. Subjects exhibit behaviors consistent with one of the eight evil thoughts described within the manuscript. Analysis of personnel and D-class under the SCP 1215's influence suggests that the alterations to the behavior are based on their prior personality. Additional testing for a strategically significant sample is ongoing. So this functions by seeing it and then walking away, and then that triggers the behavior to go into effect. The effects of SCP 1215 vary not only based on the vice manifest on which my, the, uh, on which vice manifests itself in the behavior of exposed personnel, but also in severity of behavior. Currently, symptoms are divided into three phases. Phase 1, initial, symptoms are exhibited immediately upon leaving the vicinity of SCP-1215 and are sufficiently minor that they may go unnoticed. Phase 2, intermediate, symptoms are exhibited starting approximately 12 to 36 hours of, um, of leaving the object's vicinity and, while noticeable and potentially hazardous, are unlikely to result in permanent harm to the subject or others. Phase 3, terminal. Symptoms are exhibited starting after approximately 48 to 36 hours after leaving the object's vicinity. Phase 3 symptoms often result in significant harm to the subject and personnel nearby. This is something I really admire about the format, the systematic breakdown of what makes these things function, and, you know, that we have these phases here, and we're about to get into the different uh, eight vices that are purported to be effects when personnel are exposed to SCP-1215. I just love the, the, the systems, man. The systems, they, they're rewarding, they feel good, they, they really tickle that part of my brain that appreciates Kingdom Hearts. Observed effects of SCP-1215 are as follows, though no subjects exposed to SCP-1215 have been known to exhibit more than one of these effects. Gastromargia, or gluttony. The subject develops an intense and insatiable appetite. Phase 1 symptoms are minor feelings of hunger or thirst consistent with not having eaten for several hours. Phase 2. The subject is constantly eating. Phase 3. Symptoms are attempts to eat anything nearby, regardless of whether or not the items being devoured would normally be considered food. Another thing that's beneficial about the SCP Foundation is that it is not explicitly horror all the time. It is horrific to live in that universe for sure there are so many dangers that are under that aren't understood and everything but that <laughs> there are all these weird things um like allowing for this manuscript to make people hungry to the point where they're just eat it instantly uh within uh 48 to 60 uh, to 96 hours eating anything in their vicinity that's that's funny to me and just the visual of that this person in a guard suit, just gnawing on his guard partner. That works for me. It's, it's really funny to me. 
Um, also, I'm assuming that these things are written in Greek. Googling it, I guess not. But when the manuscript was uh, written, it should be, it should theoretically be Greek, as people in Turkey at the time were speaking Greek and were Christians. But I'm not sure. Um, I am by no means a, a world history or language expert. Pornea, lust. The subject developed extremely heightened libido. Phase 1 symptoms are minor feelings of sexual arousal. Phase 2, subjects begin to experience hypersexuality and lowered sexual inhibitions. Phase 3, subjects will actively seek out sexual gratification by any means necessary, while simultaneously ignoring others' bodily, other bodily needs. No subjects have been have remained in phase 3 for long enough to confirm this, it is conceivable that an individual suffering from phase 3 pornea effects could starve to death as a direct result of their symptoms. The questions are, um, if you are suffering from phase 3 pornea, does that mean that you just like prematurely come quicker? And then after you nut, you come back to your senses and like the rest of these, uh, you just can't do anything about it. Like if you're suffering from anger or something, um, then, then maybe, uh, you're, you're not going to recover from that. You're going to like have the death drive, but like you get pornea and then you nut and then you come back to your senses and everyone's like, are you okay? <laughs> Philolangria or avarice. Subjects develop excessive greed. Phase 1 symptoms consist of heightened desire for wealth, status, and power. Phase 2 symptoms consist of attempts to acquire material possessions through theft, bribery, or other means. Hoarding is common. Phase 3 symptoms are extreme attempts to attain wealth, often including violence, trickery, and or manipulation of authority. I'm starting to develop a question about something but I'm going to read the next entry and see if it gives me any enlightenment to this question. Hyperphenia, or hubris. The subject develops extreme pride. Phase 1 symptoms are minor feelings of pride. Phase 2 symptoms include a tendency to shame others as being inferior, and a sense of gratification for doing so. Phase 3 symptoms include more extreme manifestations of phase 1 and 2 symptoms, as well as insolence, contempt, and a tendency towards violence against anyone who is perceived to have disparaged the subject. I know a lot of people on social media like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep pressing on, because I still have that question lingering. Lipe, or envy. The subject develops extreme negative emotions at the good fortune of others. Phase 1 symptoms are minor feelings of jealousy. Phase 2 symptoms include underhanded attempts to engage in character assassination, of those which the subjects feel jealous. Phase 3 symptoms are characterized by extreme negative behaviors, including strong and persistent attempts at causing misery towards the others of uh, the object of envy, and sometimes violence. Okay, so here's what I've been wondering. Do these effects hit you so hard that you are unable to... um? Can conceal these desires. So if you are, for instance, envious, are you at like phase one? Obviously, you can conceal that envy to some degree. It, it might not even be noticeable. But to a certain degree, if you hit phase three and you're doing all of these things to go out of your way to character assassinate somebody and uh, shame them and give them violence and all of these things, does that out you as being envious? Um, that, that's my question. Um, if you're stealing something, uh, if you, if you're, you know, hit with the desire for wealth and everything and avarice, are you going to be able to effectively steal and use trickery and everything? Or are people going to see through you because you're so blinded by the desire for wealth that you out yourself? And that's the question I'm having. And I, I would kind of like a little bit of clarity on that. Um, I know that that seems to be a nitpick, but I, I'm thinking that way because this, Entry is so interesting that I'm having further questions about it. Ogre, or orge? Orge. Wrath. The subject displays an intense and unstoppable rage. Phase 1 symptoms are minor feelings of annoyance and irritability. 
phase, at phase two, subjects become pugnacious through physical altercation, though physical altercations are rare. Phase three has been, once phase three has been reached, subjects will respond to the slightest trigger with extreme fury, which can result in attempts to kill those nearby. Those are what anger issues are like in a nutshell, and if you haven't grappled with them like I have, where you, you've you been uh, so conditioned to be angry that once you've gotten over that, that deal, uh, it's no longer a difficulty. Like, I don't get angry very often at all anymore because I've dealt with those issues so much, but um, you get so angry that you want to be, that you lash out at people for no reason, and that is... Dealing with this very human feeling in this very um insidious part of human nature in a realistic way. I always appreciate when I see anger issues dealt with in a realistic and practical manner. Kinodoxia, or vanity. The subject holds an excessive belief in his or her own abilities and or attractiveness to others. Phase 1 symptoms include fe- a feeling of superiority. Phase 2 involves unjustified boasting. At phase three, subjects descend into extreme self-idolatry. Note, while subjects displaying kinodoxia tend not to cause direct harm to themselves or others, they tend to cause sufficient irritation to those around them that it is not uncommon for those others to cause them harm. Okay, so this is like vanity or kinodoxia is the suicidal drive. Achidia, sloth slash dejection. The subject suffers from extreme laziness or despair. Phase 1 symptoms include procrastinating and a minor feeling of sadness. Phase 2 symptoms are consistent with extreme cases of general depressive disorder. The subject has extreme difficulty mustering the energy to perform non-essential tasks. At Phase 3, Subjects will not finish writing Unit 7. Phase 3, subjects become catatonic. So that is um, interesting. It's, it's directly tying your laziness um, to, your, in a, to your feelings of depression, to your feelings of sadness. And again, I think that that is consistent with the real-world diagnosis of depression. I like that they bring that up. They're giving this a scientific basis. I like the direct mention of general depressive disorder. Um, that is, all of this has been grounding it to the real world, and I appreciate that. History. Ava Grius wrote the Peri Logemon as a guide to understanding and learning to overcome temptation. Records recovered from the dig site, C. Redacted, suggest that SCP-1215 was an attempt by Ava Grius to create a morality tool for use by n- mostly illiterate general population. By the mostly illiterate general population. Imagine that. Imagine a turkey, right? Not a literal turkey. The country turkey. But everyone is Greek, everyone is Christian, and everyone has the literacy level of myself. Though SCP-1215 was demonstrated Effective for its purpose, records found alongside the manuscript suggest it was written earlier, approximately 373 CE, than the more widely known version of the Perilogimus, written in 30, uh, 375 CE. So this is playing into the real-life history of illuminated manuscripts. The purpose of Im- illuminated manuscripts was that people weren't literate, only the... um high priests and everything, uh, monks and, and, you know, the priestly class were literate. And so this was a way for people to appreciate the beauty of religious text without being able to read them. According to the records, found alongside SCP-1215, Evagrius, still, uh, then still a lector at Neo Caesarea and a disciple of Basil the Caesarea, created SCP-1215 and presented it to Basil. Basil, uh, 329 or 330 CE, January 1st, um, 379 CE, 
an influential theologian later canonized as St. Basil the Great, apparently rejected his pupil's creation, instructing it to be sealed away and that all subsequent versions of the work had to be substantially censored. Evidence of this censorship can be uh, seen clearly in chapter 16 of the Periologimus, where Evagrius writes, I cannot write about all the villainies of the demons, and I feel ashamed to speak about them at length and in detail for fear uh, of harming the more simple-minded among my readers. After Basil died in seventeen in, in seventeen in three seventy nine C.E. and Evagrius moved to Constantinople in three hundred eighty C.E., it appears SCP twelve fifteen was forgotten until it was rediscovered in modern times. Now, there's nothing wrong with the stories in in the SCP world where there's no direct background given and no exact explanation. But man, isn't so? Isn't it nice to just have this history here and say like, this is the context in which this was found, and Evagrius had a um, conflict with uh, Saint Basil the Great, and all of these things helping to really ground this to the world in which it is taking place. That is just refreshing, I think. SCP-1215, as well as the history surrounding it, reinforce theories that the early Christian church was involved in the containment of paranormal and preternatural items. Hmm. I like this. I like the idea that long before the SCP Foundation was around, the Catholic Church was acting as a sort of SCP Foundation, and when um, uh, Avagrius created <laughs> inadvertently, or purposefully, I suppose, an SCP, they tried to bury it. St. Basil tried to bury it. St. Basil of C- Caesarea, of Pizzeria, uh, who holds a very important place in the history of cri- uh, Christian liturgy, is a, is, and is regarded as the father of communal monetism in Eastern Christianity, as well as major influences on St. Benedict of Western Christianity, is credited with having written no fewer than three par- prayers of exorcism. Evagrius being beyond being the author of what would eventually become a major tenet of Catholicism, the Seven Deadly Sins, and being a major influence on many later church figures, was accused of heresy later in life for his esoteric speculations regarding the pre-existence of human souls. The extent to which the early Christian churches possible efforts to contain items of paranormal and preternatural natures affected the development of the Christian ethics, practices, beliefs, and Western culture as a whole is unknown at this time. So from all of this, we can infer that there was a big struggle in the Christian church at the time. St. Avagrius theorized that this thing could be used in such a manner to help quell the evils that lie inside of the human soul. But other people in the church, uh, you know, St. Basil of, uh, St. Basil the Great and various other, uh, of, um, Evagrius's peers saw that as a danger, like he was playing with fire, like he was touching something that would ultimately be more of a detriment than a benefit. And so obviously from the examples that were given, we're seeing the detriment, but the 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 story that they're telling is that the Catholic Church had the foresight to see Saint Avagrius, uh, you are a crazy person for thinking that this is going to help us. This is nothing but trouble, and I love all like it's written in such a plain language, and then you infer the story further. That is really enjoyable. This is my favorite SCP that I've read in a good long while. Man, what a nice read with a nice little history lesson as well. Now, if you enjoyed that, consider helping out the community and supporting my channel. You can support the community by conversing in the comments below, going to twospooky.com, that's T-O-O spooky.com for more original horror stories, and checking me out on Undercooked Analysis for similar content. You can support me by liking this video, following me on Twitter and Tumblr, links down in the description, as well as my art page, which is also down below. Thank you for your time, and now on to our sponsor at this non-moment in time. Francis Bacon 
Francis Bacon, the gay artist one, not the philosopher one.